So uh, my name is Tomasz Dziopa. I work for a company called uh, Absilon, uh, where I'm a project leader and software engineer. But in this presentation, I'll be talking about uh, my personal interest, uh, which is uh, natural language processing and specifically generative text modeling. And in this presentation, I hope to give you an overview of the recent advancements um, of the ways in which we can generate text. So uh, to begin with, um, generative text modeling. Uh, language models are ubiquitous, uh, but sometimes we're just not aware of them. So just to give you a first uh, hint, like one of the very simple language models that we have already in our smartphones is the one that predicts the next word uh, as we're typing. The other ones are such things as um, spell checkers or error corrections. Can you sure, yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, uh, the next topic I just wanted to briefly hint at the, at the very beginning is the, this one. One, two, one, two, okay. Uh, the next topic I wanted to briefly hint is uh, probably the headlines that you might have seen. Uh, they look a little bit scary, but actually they're coming from uh, trustful sources like Guardian or BBC or Wall Street Journal. Uh, is uh, AI going to eat us with uh, fake news generated entirely on their own? Um, I hope in the later part in the presentation to give you my view on, uh, on this point. Um, I don't think the word is that scary. And finally, you might have been playing with the websites like Talk to Transformer or Write with Transformer, uh, where you just input some prefix and later the website, uh, actually the model underlying on the website generates text. Uh, so actually on the right hand side you see a sample like I have just copy pasted from the PyData website, and if you look at the bold text, uh, it's actually the one that's generated by the GPT-2 model. It looks well, in my opinion. There are some repetitions, uh, but, well, you could believe that this was written actually by a human. Okay, uh, I mentioned the word quality. So, um, how can we measure quality? Um, one idea is to just to compare loss function of the model and to verify that uh, one model is better than the other, but it's not really telling us about the absolute quality of the model. Uh, the common way to uh, compare the, the models is to measure perplexity. So if you don't know, the perplexity is a very fancy word for confusion. So we want to basically uh, verify how confused our model is once we provide it with a sample text and verify how probable it would be for the model to generate it. And usually we calculate it as a two to the power of cross entropy loss. And the uh, final very common method of actually verifying the output of the model is a qualitative judgment. It's basically a human reading a text and saying, yes, it's a good quality. Uh, yeah, but there are also other ways to determine the quality of the language model. As the, la the models have become more and more sophisticated, uh, they're able to perform more and more sophisticated tasks. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the tasks uh, is to being, to being able to answer a question. Like uh, in a task called, I think it's spelled Winograd schema challenge. So uh, it's basically, we provide a model, um, some sample text, and we ask a simple question, what is too big? This is a, an example of a task that you may find, it's very easy, right? We obviously know that too big is the trophy. Uh, but for the model, it's not that easy to determine that the too big clause actually relates to the trophy. Uh, the other case is the Lambda, it's also a similar idea, so we basically provide a longer passage and we uh, verify like which word has the largest probability of being outputted. Uh, for us, it's also quite easy to uh, infer from the previous passage which word is the most likely, but for the model, it's not that easy. And uh, basically, state-of-the-art models are being verified by the benchmarks, like Superglue. Uh, you could have heard some time ago that the language models became better than humans in understanding or generating text. This was um, a thing with the previous benchmark called Glue, which was a little bit easier. And uh, the new version of the, of the benchmark called Superglue contains tasks that are 
just more sophisticated and more difficult for the for the models. And so far, the human baseline is not yet beaten. But as you see, the average score uh, of the human baselines is right now very close to the, the best model from Google. OK, so generative text modeling. So let's first of all think, if we were to quickly like hack some, some modeling of the text on some particular topic, how could we approach it? So the first example uh, is coming from a website that you might know. Um, it's actually a quite famous website used for booking hotels. Um, and if you have been searching for your accommodation for the conference for long enough, um, then you could have spotted that some offers have very repetitive um, passages that uh, they look a little bit artificial. And obviously, if we take a closer look, there are some passages from other offers that look very similar. So this looks like a template-based way of generating text. Uh, so it looks like this. But the problem with this approach is that it's static and repetitive. So the text looks a little bit artificial. And it has quite limited use cases to the ones that you craft the templates for. And also, it's very difficult to create the templates that will be grasping the concepts like morphology or punctuation, agreement, and paragraphs. Especially, it becomes very difficult in Polish, as we have so many different cases and uh, corner cases. Uh, there was this kind of a drawback. So if you want to have full control of what the output is, of the, what the model is outputting, then you'd probably create something like a template-based model. But if you want to allow some kind of flexibility, then you'd probably go for the neural or end-to-end -end approaches. If you want something in between, there are approaches that are called hybrid, but I won't be covering them in this presentation. So onwards to the very first model that you could have learned during your classes. Um, a, a, some kind of natural language processing is the Markov model uh, being fed with the n-grams. So the general idea is super simple. You basically feed in the data, you calculate the n-grams and their um, counts of occurrences. And later at the generation step, you once you want to generate, actually I can use the example that I have just crafted. So we have an example, Uncle Bob attended the. We have a sliding window, the sliding window moves, and we want to generate the next word. So we basically look at the uh, n-grams, uh, n minus 1 grams, with the prefix attended the. And we look at the counts of occurrences. There is a distribution. And we sample from it, and we have the next word. But there is a problem. This doesn't really contain any meaning. Uh, there is, um, if you make the n too small, it, you're not really creating sentences on any particular topic. You're just like wandering randomly around your corpus. If you uh, pick n that's too big, you are basically repeating the sentences from your corpus, which is also bad. So a uh, quick jump to more recent advancements, uh, which are called RNNs, recurrent neural networks. So in this idea, we're using a, a recurrent link that allows us to transfer the knowledge between the multiple time steps. Uh, so in the basic formulation of it, uh, because of the problems like uh, vanishing gradient or exploding gradient, it became really tricky to uh, pass the knowledge from um, one time step to another time step. Uh, I'm also saying time step because like recurrent neural networks are perfectly fit for uh, sequential kind of data. Uh, so as an extension, um, Architectures like LSTMs, so long short term memories, or gated recurrent units have been invented and they allow to uh, pass the information much more effectively. So uh, I don't know if you remember, but something around four years ago, there used to be a paper by Andre Carpati, actually, it's a blog post by Andre Carpati uh, that created a um, set of experiments using a very simple recurrent neural network that was uh, based on the character level. And um, he was just feeding various types of data, and he was receiving very convincing results. So for example, uh, one kind of result, um, um, this is basically an output of a model that was fed in with latex data. This looks like a passage from your math textbook, but it that doesn't really have any sense or any meaning. Uh, actually, in some cases, I think, no, it's, it's not this. Uh, 
not this example, but on some other examples, the model also learned to omit the proofs. Quite convincing, right? Uh, the other super interesting experiment was to feed in the Linux C kernel code into the recurrent neural network. And once again, we're talking about the network that's just using character level um, uh, level of, of abstraction. So uh, once again, the network learned to produce code that looks very convincing, although it doesn't compile. Um, on this slide, <laughs> there is a visualization of certain uh, firings of the neurons. So there are neurons that, for example, learned what is a comment, and they learned to turn on whenever the network was actually in the comment. Uh, the network also learned the concept of the level of indentation. So that's all very uh, promising, but once you take a like closer look, it doesn't really have any sense. So the language, didn't, like the language model, didn't really possess any knowledge. It's just basically how the characters fit into each other. Uh, so the approach is using the generative adversarial networks. So you probably all know what the generative adversarial network is. It's basically a set of two neural networks that. Uh, compete with each other, so the generator tries to fool the discriminator by producing uh, more and more convincing results by transforming the uh, random uniform uh, distribution into distribution that is kind of desired, like for example the celebrity faces, and then the discriminator learns how to um, distinguish those celebrity faces that are real and fake. Uh, so the overall discriminator tries to learn how to be best at this at this kind of distinction, and the generator tries to become best at fooling the discriminator. But there is a problem. So it works really well with continuous data, like for example images, celebrity faces. Uh, images are just pixels, like we can easily alter the pixel value because it's just a number, and then we can back propagate it. So how do you work with discrete um, data, like for example, sequence of characters or, or tokens. Uh, so basically two approaches that I just wanted to mention. Uh, the first one is called Gamble softmax trick. Um, that at the output of the generator, so if you imagine that the generator output is a um, vector sized um, as the size of vocabulary and it outputs the probability of the next word. If we want to back propagate through it, we can't really say we just like pick the max probability and we take it out to the discriminator phase, we need to sample somehow uh, from it. So here comes the gamble distribution. So we basically add the value from the gamble distribution. Uh, but again, we can't really take the argmax uh, because argmax is not differentiable. So in order to provide differentiability, we use softmax. And additionally, we can also use a parameter called temperature. So by altering the temperature, we're altering how much the temperature, the, the overall function looks like an argmax. And the second approach utilizes reinforcement learning. So in this case, uh, this is actually a diagram from a paper describing SecGAN. Um, the, the approach is so that the generator is a reinforcement learning agent and it generates next tokens as we go. Uh, and the discriminator feeds in the value from the environment as a reward, whether the um, next generated token was good or bad. And um, uh, this way the generator can alter its policy to um, output more and more convincing words. Uh, yeah, but lately all the hype was uh, about the transformers and the self-attention mechanism. So um, this is a very fresh adv advancement coming from I think two years ago from a paper called Attention is All You Need. And uh, this diagram shows the, the uh, basic idea uh, from it. I won't be going in, in too much detail uh, about like meaning of each exact box, uh, but uh, I just wanted to, yeah, it works. So basically the left-hand side, left-hand side is called the encoder. And the encoder um, learns the, mm, key value pairs, learns to extract the key value pairs from the text. Uh, we call it like it learns how to, um, uh, so in the recurrent neural network we are hoping so that the knowledge will somehow propagate over the recurrent neural link. Mm -hmm. In the transformer architecture it learns the um, uh, key value pairs that denote some kind of a knowledge. We don't know like 
what exactly will be uh, will end up there, but uh, the network will figure it out itself. On the right-hand side uh, is the part that's usually called decoder and learns the queries, and later in this middle, multi-head attention. Uh, these things are joined, and for the queries, we are picking the value that's key is the closest in some space to the query. And um, the overall idea is that when we read a text, it's not actually reading, we're not actually reading token by token. It's not saying that the word the is of the same uh, importance as um, any other word. So um, we're paying different attention to different parts of the text. And the model tries to uh, learn these uh, associations between the, the query and the target values. And actually, most of the recent uh, models that have been um, at the top, I think probably all of them, uh, of the supergroup benchmark, I showed a couple of slides earlier, uh, are using some variation on transformers. Um, so what's kind of puzzling about this is that transformers really learn how to model long-term dependency really well. Uh, so if you um, play with the demo on the uh, writing with transformer or like talk to transformer website, you see that the quality is superb, but also the models um, as outlined by the GPT-2 paper, uh, the models are learning surprising amount of the domain knowledge. Like for example, who's the president of the United States? Like suddenly the knowledge uh, that's um, somehow baked into the training data is being uh, persisted into the model and the model is able to answer these kind of questions with surprisingly good accuracy. So the, the fake news part, <laughs> uh, it's been promised somehow in the, in the abstract. So uh, we've been um, flooded with these headlines that are scaring us that uh, suddenly the GPT-2 will start uh, outputting very convincing text. But if you look at this text, it does look convincing, right? Like there is a there is a man and he wants to do business with you and it's like serious money, so. So actually, how does it work? So that for some people that write some random things, we say no, 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 no. But for others, we say yeah, it's totally this. In my opinion, it's actually um, we build credibility by some kind of authority. So once we see that someone has particular number of likes or particular number of comments. Uh, then this person suddenly becomes um, a credible person and probably has some kind of a knowledge. And this may be making us like convinced so that the earth is not really that round or, yeah, I will not even finish. Uh, and um, what makes me actually scared is that <laughs> the latest advancements in the models are becoming um, really impressive. So actually I think last week, um, Uber has uh, released a new model that's called plug and play language model. So in this approach, um, they, uh, they have presented, it allows you to train a very small model that allows you to, for example, distinguish uh, what's um, toxic speech and what's not toxic, not non-toxic speech. And later you can reuse that model to drive somehow the generation of the GPT-2 outputs. So in a way you can say, okay, now I want to actually write toxic speech and the GPT-2 will be doing exactly that. So uh, you're getting much more control over what you are actually generating. And if you are able to generate not only conditioned on the topic, but also on the style or some other various features, then it becomes scarily convincing. Let's try something hands-on. Well, it's not actually that hands-on. I have basically, before the presentation, I have prepared a very simple uh, language model, just to kind of ease the, the tension. It's a recurrent neural network. It's three layers of LSTM. Uh, there's a dropout. Uh, it's a network that will be feeding in uh, characters and will be trying to predict the next characters based on that. Uh, so, sounds like super simple, like for, um, based on the, the output of the last layer, I think uh, the size was two and a half million uh, neurons, so that's not that much. Uh, I have trained it on Google Colab, just because I'm on a tight budget. So, uh, 
I took a corpus out of Wikipedia. Uh, I think it was 16 megabytes large, and I put it into this network, and this is what happened. Um, I didn't want to present you like any sophisticated graphs of loss functions because it doesn't really like put us anywhere. Also, the model ring didn't really like achieve that much accuracy anyway. But if you take a look like over the iterations in the table, you start to see that some kind of patterns appear. Like this is basically a sample conditioned on the prefix Nies Vicware or incredible. So suddenly these words try to look convincing at least, like Polish-like. At the iteration 45, you suddenly see that there are more and more words that look like from Polish language. Okay, uh, also tried something more fun. Uh, so I fed in Pantadeusz, like all of it. No pre-processing, Let, let's just see what happens. And condition it on prefix uh, Gerwazy, since Gerwazy is uh, one of the main characters, uh, somehow appearing throughout the pages so many times. So. Actually, if you take a look at iteration like 400, 600, suddenly we see other character names. So the network actually learns surprising things uh, out of it. I'm not saying like we would use it in some kind of production environment, but just a fun experiment to show you that, well, you don't really need any sophisticated transformer to achieve uh, surprising results. Okay. Practical use cases. Uh, how can I actually use language models for my own users, on my own usage? Uh, there is a wonderful library called Hugging Face Transformers. Hugging Face is the company, Transformers is the name of the library. And it basically contains language models um, from the past couple of years um, with uh, the pre-trained weights, which you can very easily interface with. You can just basically, with four lines of code, you can have your own GPT-2 running on your own machine, uh, generating um, unconditioned samples. Uh, it also has really nice uh, capabilities to do some kind of fine tuning or transfer learning uh, for some more specific tasks. So for example, if you'd like to do some kind of more sophisticated sentiment analysis, uh, this might be a really nice thing to take a look at. Uh, sadly, it's mostly English. The models are mostly in English. There are some models in French, German. I think I saw something also in Romanian. Models that are multilingual are not really fit for generating the language. Uh, they also have issues with um, understanding like what kind of language you really want to see. Uh, other really interesting thing that's in this library is uh, are the distilled models. So distillation is a technique um, that allows um, creation of the models that are orders of magnitude smaller, but also have very similar uh, accuracy or perceived quality of the output text. Uh, so uh, it's really cool because you can have your language model um, of the quality of, um, I think, BERT uh, running in, on your iPhone 7. So that's, that's actually really cool. Uh, sadly, if you want to train your proper language model from scratch using these kind of architectures, it is very costly. Because we're talking about the models that have hundreds of uh, millions up to like 1.2 billion, the largest one. Uh, parameters, and in order to train them, you need to spend at least $10,000, um, and that's basically without any kind of hyperparameter tuning, so probably you can multiply that uh, by some reasonable number. So, what are the takeaways I would like you to take away from this talk? Uh, is that language models are reaching a point so that the output of them is convincing. Um, also, uh, I just mentioned it, um, there are language models that allow you to control uh, various features. Uh, actually, you can, if you go to the huggingface.co thing slash transformers or something like this, you can see uh, how many different parameters you can tr uh, alter uh, when you uh, play with the Uber model, uh, PPLM uh, in short. Uh, the models like GPT-2 are learning surprising amount of trivia knowledge. And if you want to do some kind of transfer learning, uh, that's probably a good thing to do. And um, yeah, looking at those models that I have just showed, like from the slide from RNNs up to now, we're talking about span of four years. So I just wanted to leave you with this thought, like who knows how this presentation would look like next year. Thanks.